So, Tony? Oh, yeah, you know? thank you very much. Thank you to Steve Ansel for the first hour and Barry Durr for the second hour. For the next two hours, it's the Tony Greaves Show. <laughs> Under orders from Charlie after the loss of the transmitter at Pars Wood, Andy was toiling away at the kitchen table producing a new 200 watt transmitter based around a second hand 813 valve. It wasn't a pretty sight as it was built on an old scrap chassis, but it reliably churned out about 130 watts of screen modulated RF. Charlie went on a trip around Wilmslow one day and brought back news of a row of empty, semi-derelict houses that still had mains electricity. One night after a visit to the pub, a wire aerial was erected at one of the houses, stretching from the attic window to a tree at the end of the long garden. Access to the inside of the house was blocked first by an exterior door to the cellar, but then by bricked up stairs on the ground floor. The following day, Frank went back with a selection of tools, and using an old fashioned brace and bit, he removed a square of floorboarding big enough to climb through. Once inside, he simply unlocked the side door, through which the transmitter, record decks and microphone mixer were carried for a live broadcast. Andy wasn't happy with the aerial system. There was no vertical section necessary for strong local coverage, and the horizontal run was only about half the required length. The poor match of the system was confirmed when during a test, the studio ceiling light flashed in time with the music, even though the light was switched off. A better earth was suggested, and from a cupboard under the stairs came a roll of bare aluminium cable. This was attached to the chassis of the transmitter and Andy took hold of the roll and headed for the bathroom with the intention of connecting the wire to the cold water pipe. Charlie decided to switch on the transmitter before the connection was made and the spare RF earth current ended up in Andy's hand leading to quite a nasty burn that took several years to fade. Despite this, the transmission carried on as planned. Telephone calls from friends across Manchester told a sad story though. The short horizontal aerial just wasn't up to the task and the signal was weaker than a normal 20 watt outdoor effort. Programmes continued for a few hours with Dave, Charlie and Andy taking turns at the microphone, but in the end it was decided that it was a washout. The gear was removed from the house the same day, just before the police arrived, likely having been alerted by one of the local curtain twitchers. There was always next week of course and there would be several letters asking what happened. In fact it was quite common to get more letters after a poor broadcast than a good one. We've mentioned Frank a couple of times throughout this story. Not only did he provide most of the transport but he was the official Aquarius aerial rigger. He would climb almost anything. A 60 foot tree was easy work but possibly his moment of greatest glory came when he found the post office's intercar communication channel. He'd been messing around with a cheap portable radio one day when he heard a familiar voice using one of the post office RHQ call signs. Nowadays it would be simple to just enter the frequency on a portable scanner and carry it with you, but in 1974 there was no such thing as a scanner, so other methods had to be employed. As Frank listened, it dawned on him that it was almost a gift from the gods, and he began to look for a way of constantly monitoring the channel. Aquarius went back to outdoor broadcasts for the next few weeks, and then Charlie announced he'd found another suitable house in Wilmslow. The house and its surroundings were impressive, with a tall row of poplars down the side, and the river Bolin gurgling past the bottom of the garden. There were French windows looking out to the rear, which proved an easy way in. Frank, Charlie, Bob, John and Andy installed the transmitting equipment one Saturday evening in July. Across the road was another empty house with a spacious drive and it was here that John parked with the intention that his car should serve as a dormitory for an overnight stay. It was a cold night however so they went into the house instead. Andy shut himself in a cupboard and others found equally unlikely places to curl up. 
The following morning, after a rough night, they agreed that a drink of something would be very welcome, so they all piled into John's car for a trip to the local newsagent or corner shop. After a while, it was clear that at 6.30 on a Sunday morning, nowhere was open. While they were thinking about what to do, a police panda car drew to a halt just behind. Up strolled the copper and John wound his window down in readiness. After the usual, is this your vehicle sir question and answer session, it was down to the real business. The constable looked through the open window at the unshaven crew inside and his interest seemed to centre on the unusual number of radio sets in the car. What's all this then, he said, pointing to one of the radios. John looked at Charlie. Charlie looked dumb and said it's a radio, then realising he'd be better off not being a smart aleck just at this moment. He added, we're radio enthusiasts listening for a special station. The policeman's face showed no change of expression. He asked if they could open the boot. John stepped out of the car and walked around to the rear. Up went the boot lid and the guys in the car could hear muffled conversation and the sound of tools and so on being moved around. After a while the boot was closed and John cheerfully hopped back into the driver's seat. Well, said Charlie. Well, said John, he was just a bit suspicious at the sight of a car full of scruffy Herberts parked up at this hour on a Sunday morning. When he saw the radios, he thought he was onto something, as there'd been a spate of burglaries in the area. So, what did you tell him, pressed Charlie. John smiled and said he wasn't convinced by the radio enthusiast story, so I decided to tell him the truth, that we were putting a radio station on the air at 11 o'clock, that all of this stuff in the car was our own, and we'd probably be out of the area by 4 or 5 this afternoon. Charlie burst out laughing and said, you're kidding. John said no I'm not, but he did say he didn't want to see us hanging around in the area again, so we'd better move on. The transmission started at 11 o'clock, but soon Frank said he could hear activity on the post office channel. It was difficult to tell whether Aquarius was the target, or if the tracking team were after something more mundane, but it wasn't normal for the post office to be out on a Sunday morning unless they were after something special, so the transmitter was disconnected and a hiding place found. The only place available was the space underneath the bath, so they removed the side panel and pushed the transmitter inside. The cassette player was hidden under the floor and they left. That afternoon they decided that it would be safe to re-enter the house and retrieve the equipment, but on removing the side of the bath they saw that someone had had it away with the transmitter, carefully refitting the panel and replacing the screws. Surely Gordon's men wouldn't have gone to the trouble of finding a location pinching the transmitter and then just leaving. Wouldn't they have lain in wait for their return, ready to pounce? That thought seemed to occur to everyone at once, and it was time for their second sharp exit of the day. The kidnapping of the high power transmitter brought the return of more sensible outdoor broadcasts. Near the centre of Sale in Cheshire was a small wooded area adjacent to the new shopping precinct, and Charlie reckoned it was just the job for a standard Sunday transmission. It was risky though as members of the public in the precinct would be only too eager to call the police at the sight of any suspicious activity, especially in the view of the IRA's mainland bombing campaign which was responsible for several town centre explosions. Sunday August the 4th 1974 was a typical British summer's day, overcast with a threat of rain in the air. Frank and Andy made a start on wiring the transmitter up while the others hoisted the wire quarterwave aerial into the trees and shoved earth rods into the soil. At 5 to 11 the car battery was connected and Aquarius's carrier hit the airwaves on 256 metres. When the first tape had begun, a walk around the shops revealed a phone box from which Charlie made calls to his friends asking them to check reception. Everything went without a hitch until about 1.30pm when police cars, traffic cars and even police Land Rovers began to converge on the precinct. A traffic car hurtled down one of the walkways heading straight for Charlie who was making one of his phone calls. Charlie thought his time was up but the car sped by and screeched to a halt at the end of the shops. Trying to act as casually as possible they regrouped and discussed what to do next. The last tape would be over in a few minutes, and to reduce the risk of a post office raid, the transmitter ought to be turned off as soon as the tape finished. There didn't have to be any music playing for the post office to zero in on a transmitting site. 
However, the sight of a long-haired weirdo creeping in the woods at a time like this would certainly arouse suspicion, so there was nothing to do other than keep a low profile, and a nearby pub, the Volunteer Hotel, looked as good a place as any. Once inside, they sat quietly, occasionally listening to the radio to see if there was any sign of the car battery giving up. Through the window, police and now army vehicles could be seen taking up positions at various road junctions and nobody in the pub seemed to have any idea what it was all about. Then, to Bob's horror, an army truck jammed on its brakes right outside the pub and a number of soldiers piled out. Nothing happened, the soldiers and policemen were obviously not after the group of youths involved with a local pirate station, but whatever it was, it certainly put the wind up Charlie, Bob and Andy. However, the main problem was still to be solved. A quick listen to the radio showed that the silent carrier was still on the air at full power. When the pub closed, the transmitter was still going strong, and the only thing to do was go home and come back for the stuff after dark, when the battery would be well and truly flat. While Andy was waiting to go, Frank phoned him with a very interesting tale about what he'd heard on his modified radio set. On arriving home he'd gone straight to his radio room and tuned around for the post office and it wasn't long before he came across some RHQ call signs, obviously in the process of taking bearings on Aquarius. It sounded as though a bust was in the offing, but he realised there was nothing he could do. He and Charlie should have made arrangements to keep in touch by using the phone box in the shopping centre, but it was too late to do anything now. When the programme tape finished, he was surprised to hear one of the post office operatives say that's it, end of transmission, everybody meet back at base too. They must have been expecting to hear the carrier go off soon and thought there was no time left. The drive to sale didn't take that long at that time of night and a tour of the area showed that all the activity and excitement from earlier that day had died away. It was dark in the wood, but it didn't take long to locate the transmitter, and the team began gathering all the bits and pieces together. If you're still following the story, then join me tomorrow for Chapter 5, for one of the biggest and most daring chases by the GPO after Radio Aquarius. For your summer holidays this year, why not visit the sun-drenched shores of Salford? You're listening to the Tony Greaves programme on Sunday Radio. It's Tony Greaves.